Well, it is a treat to be back here, and I want to thank uh, Doug initially for inviting me uh, to speak to you. He came down to Coral Gables, Florida about a year ago and uh, broached the subject of me speaking, and I said, yeah, I think I might be interested. And um, thanks to Doug and the Henry Center and as well the uh, Templeton Religion Trust, I'm here with you today. Um, I should say I am not a cognitive scientist of religion. I come to the subject after about six months of study, but um, I became interested um, in this subject because uh, I knew that there had been works done on petitionary prayer by cognitive scientists. I knew Edwards also had something to say about petitionary prayer, so I've wed these two together and um, we'll see what happens. So in this presentation, I'd like to extend the findings of cognitive science to one kind of religious practice, prayer, and more particularly, petitionary prayer in the life and writings of Jonathan Edwards. My intent is to provide something for students of Edwards as well as to address the themes related to reclaiming theological anthropology in an age of science by examining some of the conclusions of cognitive scientists regarding human nature. In retrieving the past, I hope to speak to present theological and pastoral challenges. However, a word of caution. I am aware of the danger of the historical fallacy of anachronism, of interpreting the past through the lens of the present, but nevertheless, I'm convinced that applying cognitive science to a fundamental aspect of spiritual life offers a conceptual tool for gaining insight into the prayers of Jonathan Edwards and his Northampton congregation. So first, let me say something about the cognitive science of religion. Um, I has the outline circulated among you. Um, I hope that'll be helpful. So according to Justin Barrett, one of the leading scholars in the field, cognitive science scientists bring scientific evidence to bear on claims and predictions about how humans think and the character of the human mind and attempt to discover naturalistic explanations for the phenomena uh, the data reveal. Cognitive scientists study domains of human thought, including perception, attention, memory, conceptualization, communication, decision-making, imagination, feelings or emotions, general tendencies, natural limitations, and biases. One of the theoretical problems pursued by cognitive scientists considers a fundamental question. Are there certain behaviors, personality dispositions, or ways of thinking that reflect the operation of evolved cognitive systems? Another way of asking it, the question is, is there intuitive knowledge that all people share as part of our natural, not practiced, cognitive development? In the last 30 years, the interdisciplinary field of cognitive science has expanded into the realm of religion, examining the ways the human mind works and thinks in matters related to religious beliefs and practices. Psychologists and anthropologists in particular have used the tools of cognitive science to study religion, researching and conducting experiments into the ways in which our mental tools, plus the surrounding environment, resist, contest, or encourage the spread of particular religious ideas, beliefs, and practices. I want to focus on two important discoveries by cognitive scientists that relate to the study of religion. And there are many more, but I'll just mention two. First, religion is natural. And second, humans employ a dual process or two system model of reasoning. So first, religion is natural. According to cognitive scientists, the mind is not a tabula rasa or blank slate. It is not a passive receptor or a sponge waiting to be influenced by the surrounding environment. Yes, nurture does influence the trajectory of our lives in important ways, but so does nature. One of the basic conclusions of cognitive scientists is that people seem naturally receptive or predisposed to religious concepts. They have a God awareness developed as a byproduct of evolutionary processes. Religious thinking and experiencing, like all human thought and experience, is neurologically and cognitively mediated. And if you're at all familiar with this area of study, 
Uh, they've done lots of experiments, brain scans, such things as that, to uh, attempt to an, an empirically, empirical way uh, to determine the influence of religious ideas and practices on people's minds. For one group of cognitive scientists, the militant atheists, including the likes of Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Paul Bloom, Pascal Boyer, and Jesse Baring, to name a few of the most prominent, the fact of the presence of the idea of God, or spirits, uh, does not prove that this God actually exists. From their perspective, religion is merely a byproduct of human evolution or a spillover of childish thinking or a remnant of folk psychology or an adaptive illusion that from their perspective we'd be better off without. For them, religion is nothing more or nothing but than a natural phenomenon, a cultural trait that evolved to increase its own transmission much like a disease organism such as a virus or a parasite just hangs on without benefiting human individuals or groups. To be sure, religion is a natural phenomenon. Regardless of metaphysical claims, states Justin Barrett, who by the way is a Christian, uh, some of you may know that he now teaches at Fuller Theological Seminary, what we observe as religion is still a constellation of human phenomena communicated and regulated by natural human perception and cognition. Natural human processes are at work in religion, something few Christians would deny. In a sense, cognitive science confirms the Apostles Paul contention in Romans 1, 19 and 20 and Calvin's census divinitatis, although without acknowledging that God is the source of this predisposition. Cognitive science demonstrates that a belief in a divine source behind the world and its events is actually quite natural. Religious belief comes naturally to children who are, as Barrett titled his work, born believers. Preschoolers are inclined to see purpose and design everywhere, what the de developmental psychologist Deborah Kellerman calls promiscuous teleology. Young children, perhaps as young as one year old, acknowledge that it takes someone to create order or purpose, not just something, and that someone is not human. Children spontaneously interpret events in the world as the product of intelligent, uh, intentional agents, people, or other beings, and in fact, of a god or spirits who has caused the natural world. Children are, contends Kellerman, intuitive theists. These conclusions apply even to children raised in militantly atheistic homes. The belief in God or gods extends into adulthood and is amplified by our survival mechanisms. In fact, the survival of our ancestors depended upon what Barrett calls a hyper-agency detection device, or had. For example, when walking in the woods and hearing a twig break or seeing movement in the bushes, humans immediately detect some agent, a predator threatening their life. Of course, the sound or the movement may not be a predator, False positives drastically outnumber the true positives, but our ancestors adapted to the menacing environment and survived by attributing agency to any potential threats. Better to be safe than sorry. Uh, better to assume the rustling in the bush is a hungry bear or malicious human than to make a potentially fatal mistake by ignoring it. This natural propensity by children and adults to detect non-human agency around us is part of why humans so easily sense the presence of supernatural agents in their environment. When there are experiences where agency is unclear, for example, unusual misfortune or fortune, there is a tendency to regard these experiences as evidence of the activity of a god or gods. Adults do not outgrow this inclination to see the world in teleo-functional terms. In one study, even atheists implicitly admitted that, quote, everything happens for a reason, unquote. Random events in life have causes. Attributing the cause or blame for a great many events or conditions to God or a God strikes many adults as reasonable. If anything, adults have to unlearn this natural proclivity override it or tap it down. Their default setting is, is to trust in the existence of super agents, gods or God, working behind the scenes and making things happen. According to the evolutionary biologist Dominic Johnson, we live as if we are being watched 
whether by spirits, ancestors, or God, or some other ordering principle of the universe. And because we are being watched, we're being judged for our actions by a supernatural agent, God, or a supernatural agency, karma. What goes around comes around. This belief in supernatural reward and punishment is cross-cultural, a ubiquitous phenomenon of human nature. No matter how scientifically informed we might be, people continue to believe that events have supernatural meaning. Religious beliefs come creeping back into one's consciousness despite one's best efforts to get rid of them. Atheism, Johnson asserts, is not a battle just against culture, but against human nature. Or in the words of Jesse Baring himself, a militant atheist, to remove God or supernatural agents from the human mind would require a neurosurgeon, not a science teacher. Let me turn to the two-system model of reasoning. As fascinating and controversial as the naturalness of religion is from a cognitive science uh, perspective, I want to turn to a second finding that, as we will see shortly, has direct implications for the study of prayer. This is the proposed dual processing or two-system model of reasoning. According to cognitive scientists, the brain is like a book. Nature provides the first draft, while experiences contribute to ongoing revisions. The initial draft, written by our genes and fetal development, reflects built-in cognitive biases, that is, aspects of reasoning that are considered basic, intuitive, quick, tacit, effortless, or non-reflective. They come naturally. They do not have to be learned in any conscious way. Subsequent revisions of, to the first draft, a higher level of reasoning, comes through lived experience. They are the result of reflective, conscious, deliberate, or explicit thought. One of the best examples of that, and I'll give you some uh, in Christianity itself in a second, but one of the best examples of that is language acquisition. Children simply naturally learn how to speak. But when it comes to reading, that's another task. It's one of those reflective, higher level tasks that must be engaged in. This two-tier model has implications for religion. The features of the first mode of reasoning, belief in God, gods or spirits, are subsequently elaborated theologically or particularized in the second mode of reasoning, which my guess is probably 100% of you that are here engage in that second uh, mode of reasoning. Yet this move, this mental move from natural religion to the thoughtful, deliberative second mode of reasoning is not easy. The anthropologist T.M. Lorman has studied the difficulty of making sense of the supernatural among U.S. evangelicals, observing that, quote, they often believe in some abstract, absolute sense that God exists, but struggle to experience God as real in the everyday world around them. For many who believe intuitively that the supernatural exists, it takes effort to accept that a particular interpretation of the supernatural is correct, and it takes effort to live in accordance with the interpretation, to live as if they really do believe that their understanding is correct." End of quote. This transition from natural religion to theology is not only difficult, but can lead to a tension, if not a contradiction, in our way of thinking. As Barrett notes, there seems to be a difference between what people tend to believe in an automatic sort of way and what they believe when they stop to reflect and systematically figure out what they do and do not believe. Adults, he continues, may actually have two or more different sets of ideas about God. Those of you who work in pastoral environments, I think, have been witnesses to this in your uh, effort to, uh, to teach, instruct, um, those in your congregation. The results from a number of experiments conducted by Barrett and others indicate that, quote, ideas that deviate too far from our natural conceptual tendencies are difficult to use. Put another way, in catechism, sermons, and other forms of theological instruction, we learn theologically correct notions, whereas in everyday settings, an incorrect, though natural, Theologic under, theological understanding may simply crop up directly from the depths of the human mind. Christians play a perpetual game of theological whack-a-mole. 
For example, there is a tendency to anthropomorphize God. Some of this inclination is, of course, drawn from the Bible itself, although the theologically correct way of interpreting anthropomorphisms is to understand them in a metaphorical sense. Yet the data suggests that in real life activities, God is automatically treated anthropomorphically. God is made into the image of ourselves as a superhuman. Thus, Christians, as does the Bible, often speak of the hand of God. He's got the whole world in his hands. Or they declare God sees. His eye is on a sparrow. Or more crudely, they may refer to the big guy in the sky. Why so? This conception of God is more easily comprehended, related to, etc. The theological God is radically different from the intuitive God described in everyday discourse. The ontological chasm between humans and God, conclude the authors of one study, is solved by ignoring the difference. In some cases, non-reflective beliefs contradict or challenge religious beliefs. For example, you may be a Calvinist who is a theological determinist in some way when it comes to conversion, yet you may be involved in an evangelical ministry trying to persuade people to follow Jesus, assuming, even representing to those you are trying to convert, that they have the freedom to become a Christian. Now, I know there are ways to reconcile limited election and God's predestinating decrees with active evangelism. Jonathan Edwards certainly thought so, but it does take some reflective, higher level thinking to square these apparent contradictions. What theory of mind research indicates is that at the natural, basic level, there exists a strong, non-reflective belief that people possess freedom to act on the basis of one's own desires. Consider another example, the Christian doctrine of grace. Intuitively, it's not a natural idea. People across cultures seem to have a deeply ingrained sense of fair exchange practices and the need to reciprocate. No one wants to be in someone's debt. We try to settle accounts. Accordingly, no matter how many times we are told it's all about grace or God doesn't need anything from you, we just cannot seem to shake the nagging feeling that God wants something from us in exchange for salvation. We must do something to placate God. We must balance the ledger. I was made especially aware of this in reading Philip Yancey's book on prayer, and uh, I'll give you a couple of quotes from Yancey that very much follow this train of thought. Um, he writes, by instinct, I must do something in order to be accepted. Grace sounds like a startling note of contradiction, of liberation, and every day I must pray anew for the ability to hear its message. And then he also quotes, he quotes uh, Simone Weil, all the natural movements of the soul are controlled by laws analogous to those of physical gravity. Grace is the only exception. Indeed, a sort of quid pro quo, if then formula, injects itself into understanding our relationship with God. Martin Luther was well aware of this inclination, making the correct doctrinal distinction between a human-centered act of righteousness and a passive Christ-centered righteousness, he wrote, can never be taught, urged, and repeated enough. These kinds of considerations have led some cognitive scientists of religion to conclude that the concept of God's radical and complete grace is counterintuitive to the way people think. How then is the unnatural and counterintuitive concept of God's radical grace theologically corrected? Grace may change everything, but not without constant teaching, preaching, reminding, and the influence of a nurturing community. The point to all this is that religious concepts evol involving reflective thought often have intuitive violations and thus are difficult to maintain consistently. In real-time situations, argue cognitive scientists, we often default to basic intuitive reasoning. Let me turn to then uh, cognitive science and petitionary prayer. We'll finally, we'll eventually get to Edwards, so. <laughs> so from these general findings, I want to examine how cognition informs one particular class of religious phenomenon, that of petitionary prayer. Specifically, I interrogate Jonathan Edwards' view of petitionary prayer and those of his congregation, both from a theologically, theologically correct and theologically incorrect perspective. 
In this regard, cognitive science, science helps to clarify religious doctrine from the inside. However, uh, first let me make some general comments about the focus and nature of petitionary prayer. One reason for peti petitionary prayer stands out above all others, and that is seeking God's help in matters of health. Throughout the centuries, prayers related to physical health have been the staple of Christian piety. I became especially aware of this in two contexts, both of which coincided to spark my interest in pursuing the subject of this presentation. First, as an elder in a Presbyterian church, I am privy to weekly prayer requests and praises from the congregation. By far, there are more requests than praises, and among the requests, the plurality address health concerns, mostly physical, but also emotional. A six-month review of weekly requests included the following health-related concerns. It will come as no surprise to most of you. Surgeries for the knee, the back, the heart. Prayer requests for broken hips, vertigo, various cancers, pregnancies, multiple sclerosis, blood clots, kidney stones, pregnancy, and flu. And by the way, we have a young congregation. <laughs> I'm among the few uh, gray hairs and no hairs in the congregation, but these are, again, typical of the requests that would come our way. On the mental health side, requests were made for anxiety, depression, and addiction. Occasionally, praises appeared. For example, for safety on a recent trip, or the admission of children into, into a desired school, some prayer requests were explicit. Parents requested prayer for the delivery of a healthy baby. A mother asked prayer for the perfect health of her son. A wife asked that prayers be made for a healthy report of her husband's new heart valve. A daughter asked for prayers that her dad would have a full recovery from a broken hip. However, most requests did not explicitly mention what was to be prayed for, although I think it's safe to say these requests were made with the expectation that prayers would be directed to a positive outcome, that is to say, for good health and healing. I also think it's safe to say that these prayers, these kinds of prayer requests, are quite typical in American Christian churches. The other context for my attention to petitionary prayer is historical. As a student of Jonathan Edwards, I became aware of prayer requests made by his Northampton congregation. Called prayer bids or prayer bills, these requests were delivered weekly to the pastor on small clips of paper. <clears throat> Given the scarcity of paper in the colonial period, Edwards saved the petitioner's notes for scrap paper and in some cases sewed them into booklets uh, used for sermons and in others inserting them into his private notebooks. Of the 99 prayer bids culled from Edwards's manuscripts by Stephen Stein, nearly all were directed towards illnesses, accidents, and deaths. Ironically, as much as Jonathan Edwards promoted prayer for revival, his congregants had less spiritual matters on their minds. Perhaps by their very intent, prayer bids were to address this worldly concerns, or perhaps the content of the requests reflected what most preoccupied the minds of the colonists. Whatever the case, the prayer bids echoed a constant theme that God would, quote, sanctify his holy and afflicting hand, close quote, in taking away infants, children, parents, spouses, and siblings, and that, quote, some spiritual good, unquote, would come of this loss. Sickness and accidents were an everyday occurrence in colonial life. Pleurisy, cancer, long fever, throat distemper, the bloody flux, were common references by petitioners. Fatal accidents from burns, drowning, and other mishaps were also mentioned. On four occasions, prayer for safety in the military expedition, expedition against the French at Cape Breton were noted, uh, more about which I will say later. In a few instances, parishioners submitted prayer bids of praise, giving thanks for the safe delivery of a baby and the continued health of the mother, or sparing a man's life from a falling tree. Prayers were offered for recovery from illness, often with the addendum that God would, quote, fit him or her for his sovereign will and pleasure, whether it be in life or by death. Now, in both congregations, mine and Edwards's, the ecclesiastical settings are and were firmly situated in the Reformed tradition. In both churches, 
leaders and members subscribe to the Westminster Confession and would affirm the answer to question 98, what is prayer? Whose answer is, prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Despite the time gap of two and a half centuries, one might expect that shared doctrine would result in a theologically consistent view of petitionary prayer. That is, that both my church and Edwards's would agree on the nature of petitionary prayer in consideration of the expectations from the requests and the manner in which God answers prayer. This expectation, however, does not hold. First, there was nothing distinctively reformed in the petitions at my Presbyterian church. There was seldom mention of praying for things agreeable to his will. There may have even been a hint that prayers could move God to act. Despite its reformed roots and the denomination's attention to correct doctrine, most of the church attenders are, even, are, are generic evangelicals, not particularly well informed regarding the nature of reformed doctrine and prayer. Second, the provincials of Edwards's day were much more likely than the moderns of ours to interpret bad things that happened as acts of divine chastisement. In the past, people cried out to God. Today, we call an ambulance or phone the doctor. Illnesses and accidents fit with the Puritan's providential theology of affliction. As Cotton Mather noted, those who suffered from toothache should recall that the original sin had been committed with the teeth when Adam and Eve bit into the forbidden fruit. In the Northampton prayer bids, the theological language of the Reformed tradition permeates the requests. As Stein observes, it is striking how well the townspeople speak that language, well enough and with sufficient consistency to imply considerable familiarity and understanding, perhaps a measure of the impact of the preaching in Northampton, an evidence of the continuing influence of Puritan theology in the middle of the 18th century, and a reflection of the staying power of local religious practice solidified by years of experience in the community. Viewing Stein's comments from a cognitive science uh, perspective, we have a case where natural religion is overridden by theological correctness. For that to happen, a great deal of what Barrett calls cultural scaffolding or constant theological self-correcting must occur. The natural tendency is to foreground private pragmatic interests to engage God in an instrumental way to coax God to act. As we will see, Edwards' sermons on prayer expose this tendency among his parishioners. However, in their prayer bids, the Northampton inhabitants as children of Puritans and more immediately of the ministrations of Jonathan Edwards exhibited a theologically correct understanding of prayer. How might the congregations in Edwards' day and in my own think about the manner in which God responded to their prayers? As research indicates, more often than not, the return on petitionary prayers, that is, the outcome desired by the petitioner, is pretty bleak. There is no convincing evidence for the efficacy of petitionary prayer or other forms of supernatural intervention in the natural world. The most extensive and careful studies of petitionary prayer have not shown statistically significant results. That's a quote from uh, uh, a couple of uh, cognitive scientists. People pray, but the wife dies in childbirth. The grandfather doesn't survive the surgery. The son is killed in war. A friend succumbs to the ravages of cancer. The wayward child continues to reject the faith. The prayed for job doesn't come through. The hurricane doesn't spare your community. Uh, I'm, this is close to home uh, for me. In my case, Hurricane Andrew in 1992 did not spare our community. Uh, Hurricane Irma in 2017 did. As C.S. Lewis remarked, every war, every famine, almost every deathbed is a monument to a petition that was not granted. So why don't failed petitions shake the faith of believers? Because, contends Barrett, the religious system has a large degree of what he calls conceptual control. That is, it has the ability to withstand alleged evidence of failure. 
How does the religious community accommodate the possibility of failure? What answers are given? In the case of Edwards's parishioners, they responded with a theology of dependence in recognition of the sovereignty of God. They had no interest whatsoever in interrogating evidence for or against their beliefs in this domain. Writes Stein, in requests arising from situations of distress, the petitioners regarded themselves as deficient in capacity and therefore in need of assistance. Powerless to help themselves, they turned to God, whose goodness, wisdom, and power were acknowledged by the very act of the request. Prayer and distress served as an affirmation of faith as well as a cry of alarm. The stated hope that God would be pleased to act on their behalf and the conventional refrain, if it be his will, were public declarations of dependence on his sovereign decision. If God did not choose to answer the request for aid, the petitioners affirmed and they desired assistance in accepting his pleasure. No question were raised concerning divine prerogatives. Total submission informs the frequent refrain, but if he has otherwise determined that he would prepare them for his will. In prayer requests arising from situations of good fortune, the parishioners acknowledge that the source of their happiness was in God's action in raising or giving and preserving. I'll say more about the contents of this theology shortly when I discuss Edwards' views of prayer, but note the general emphasis on submission to the divine will. Moreover, there is in play what psychological research identifies as confirmation bias. That is, people pay attention to and remember confirmations of direct answers to prayer while they offer other explanations as to why their prayers may go unanswered. Most of you know these responses. For example, God may have a different timetable, or God may deny the request for God's own good reason, or God's ways are past finding out, or God cannot be coerced through prayer. Or in what has been expressed through the centuries, prayer functions as a form of spiritual self-help. As Augustine put it, the purpose of prayer is to construct the soul, not to instruct God. Calvin affirmed the same. God ordained prayer not so much for his own sake as for ours. Or as expressed in the Northampton uh, prayer bids, that God would fit him or her for his sovereign will and pleasure. What these responses suggest is that believers are able to transcend the basic level reasoning that conceives of God in instrumental, transactional, or pragmatic terms and offer more theologically correct answers that are expressed in relational terms. God always responds, but only sometimes answers prayer in the sense of God bringing about that which was requested by the, parishioner, or by the petitioner. An updated version of these views is the serenity prayer by Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. This is what I call a hedge all bets prayer. Instead of asking God to intervene directly, the request is made to influence one's spiritual or psychological attitude regarding a certain condition. To rely upon a God, in Calvin's words, who quote, will never forsake us, who cannot disappoint since all good things are contained in him. These responses to petitionary prayer have been the church's staple response throughout the centuries and certainly they reflect the Puritans' perspective. According to Rick Ostrander, the Puritans recognized certain conditions on prayer that had to be met, such as having faith, praying from a godly motive and with God's glory in mind and praying in submission to God's will. Edwards cited similar reasons for prayers that went unanswered. God may see that what people ask for is not best for them. Some people pray for the wrong things, such as temporal goods. God doesn't hear insincere and unbelieving prayers. As he put it, the mouth seems to pray, but the heart don't pray. Or God exercises his own wisdom as to the time and manner of answering prayer. Note the difficulty of measuring these necessary spiritual, psychological attitudes. By being structured to accommodate a certain amount of failure, traditional theological conceptions of petitionary prayer enable believers to transcend basic level reasoning. Here prayer is effective 
in helping people cope psychologically or spiritually. This is especially so in health-related problems where God is seen as providing comfort, nurturance, and a source of personal strength in dire circumstances. Let me turn next to Edwards and the life of prayer. Although Edwards's waking moments were bathed in prayer, we know little about the actual content of his prayer life. According to Samuel Hopkins, Edwards' first biographer and boarder in the Edwards household, Edwards kept his personal devotions secret. However, there are enough glimpses to know that his prayer life conformed to Puritan devotional practices, especially what were called secret or private prayer, of which there were two types. Ordinary prayers set at set times and what were called ejaculatory or extraordinary prayer. In his personal narrative, Edwards noted that as a boy, eight or nine years old, during a spiritual awakening in his father's congregation in East Windsor, Connecticut, in 1712, he was so affected that he used to pray five times a day in secret, and that he met with other boys to pray together. They, quote, built a booth in the swamp in a very secret and retired place for a place of prayer. And Jonathan also created a secret praying place of his own. Nearly a decade later, he described his conversion experience as one where he had, quote, a sense of glory of being swallowed up in God to the extent that he went to prayer, to pray to God that I might enjoy him, and prayed in a manner quite different from what I used to do with a new sort of affection. A year or two later, Edwards wrote that he was almost constantly, quote, in ejaculatory prayer wherever I was, prayer seemed natural to me as the breath by which the inward burnings of my heart had vent. In 1722, he began composing his resolutions, number 29 of which reads, resolved never to count that a prayer, nor let that pass as a prayer, nor that as a petition of a prayer which is so made that I cannot hope that God will answer it. At about the same time, he recorded in his diary that he applied himself, quote, to the duty of secret prayer and yet resolved somewhat, uh, some months later when I am lifeless in secret prayer to force myself to expatiate as if I were praying before others more than I used to. To that end, he set aside personal prayer time at least twice a day. Following his marriage to Sarah Pierpont in 1727, he prayed with her at least once a day, and when children followed, so did family prayer. Among recent biographers, Ian Murray has commented most extensively about Edwards' prayer life. Writes Murray, prayer was not a compartment in his daily routine, an exercise which possessed little connection with the remainder of his hours alone. Rather, he sought to make his study itself, itself a sanctuary and whether wrestling with scripture, preparing sermons, or writing in his notebooks, he worked as a worshiper. Thought, prayer, and writing were all woven together." Close quote. In keeping with Puritan tradition and biblical precedent, Edwards's prayers from the pulpit were free or conceived. True prayers of the heart were spoken spontaneously. Ministers as, ex as exemplars of true religion were not to be tied to what was called the stinted liturgy, sorry Jeffrey, of Anglican and Catholic churches. According to Hopkins, Edwards was the farthest from any appearance of a form as to his words and manner of expression of almost any man. He was singular and inimitable in this. He appeared to have much of the grace and spirit of prayer. Because Edwards and other giants of his day, such as Cotton Mather and George Whitfield, thought it improper to use written prayers of any kind, we have no record of this vital Christian devotional activity. Despite the absence of personally writ uh, written prayers, Edwards has left us with extensive commentary on prayer in his sermons and other writings. Perhaps the best known is his humble attempt, wherein following similar efforts to promote revival in Scotland, he called for a concert of prayer throughout the colonies. A close second is Edwards' Life of Brainerd, an edited account of the diary kept by David Brainerd in which Edwards extolled Brainerd's prayer life as a model to follow. His sweetest joys, wrote Edwards, of this abstemious missionary to the Native Americans were in his closet, his closet devotions, that is secret devotions, and solitary transactions between God and his own soul. 
He delighted greatly in sacred retirements and loved to get away from all the world to converse with God alone in secret duties. Edwards enjoined all Christians, whatever their ages or status, to engage in fervent, constant prayer for revival. Amid the Great Awakening of 1741, he advised a recent convert to, quote, set aside a day of uh, fasting and secret prayer, uh, uh, searching your heart, looking over your past life, confessing your sins before God. In ordination sermons, he urged ministers to imitate their great master in his fervent prayers for the good of the souls of men. During times of spiritual awakening, he recommended praying societies where men, women, young men and young women, boys and girls, prayed in separate groups, quote, to promote the work of God and advance the kingdom of Christ. This was the highest priority of prayer. Pray for the time when the light will enlighten the whole world. The prayers of the saints, he wrote, and some thoughts concerning the present revival of religion in New England should be one of the great and principal means for carrying on the design of Christ's kingdom in the world. When God has something very great to accomplish for his church, tis his will that there should precede it the extraordinary prayers of his people. We may ask, however, if extraordinary prayers preceded the spiritual awakening in Edwards' congregation. Was the little awakening of 1734, uh, 1735 and the great awakening of 1740, 41, the result of the extraordinary prayers of God's people? Were they praying with greater fervor than at other times? Did they pray with greater faith? Were more people praying than before? If so, why then was the awakening that Edwards termed a surprising work of God? Does the quality and or quantity of prayer make a difference. Edwards' his own prayer requests and concerns in his correspondence reflected his, his advice to others. He desired, quote, the fervent prayers of George Whitfield, that God would more and more pour out his spirit upon us, and that in particular, he, Jonathan, would be filled with his spirit and may become fervent as a flame of fire in my work. He asked his colleague, Joseph Bellamy, to pray that God would continue to rev revive New England, and especially that God would fill me with his own fullness and improve me as an instrument to revive his work. He wrote to his daughter Mary, my desire in daily prayer is that you may meet with God and have much of his divine influences in your heart. And similarly to his son Timothy, that God would make you wise to salvation. Whether on a personal or cosmic scale, Edwards, uh, Edwards considered his lofty vision of millennial glory to be the primary purpose of not only theologically correct, but also a reflection of biblically correct prayer. Prayers in the New Testament minimize personal wants, desires, or predicaments, but are aimed primarily at the success of the apostolic mission, the coming kingdom of God, personal and corporate sa sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit, and perseverance on Judgment Day. Edwards's people, however, often had more earthly mundane concerns on their minds. In a fast day sermon in November 1740, Edwards berated his congregation for not being sincere in their prayers for the outpouring of the Spirit. Temporal affairs, a measles epidemic, and unseasonably cold rainy weather undoubtedly preoccupied the minds of his people, but Edwards thought their minds should be elsewhere. In his sermon, he addressed weather conditions, although to make his point, he discussed not rain but drought, observing that if there is natural drought, Christians engage in serious prayer. But if there is spiritual drought, God is not earnestly sought. Yet the Holy Spirit, quote, is the greatest blessing that can be asked. We have seen, noted Edwards, that God is to hear prayer for such a blessing as rain, but God is much more ready to bestow spiritual showers. He is much more ready to shower down of his Holy Spirit than he is rain. During the ensuing 18 months, <clears throat> the Great Awakening swept through the Connecticut River Valley, yet in April 1741, Edwards again admonished his congregation for their short-sighted concerns. They insist much in their prayers on petition for personal favors, spiritual blessings to be bestowed on themselves, but the state of God's church in general is commonly too much neglected. Without the prayers of the people, the glorious millennium would be forestalled. 
Did Edwards have no interest in praying for temporal affairs? Clearly he did. He asked for prayers for his three-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, who was, quote, in a very languishing, dangerous state. He preached a fast day sermon, imploring his congregation to pray that God would spare them from the 1735 epidemic in Boston. A year later, he preached a sermon to pray for rain, and in 1745, on the eve of the American-English attack on the French citadel at Louisburg, he preached, quote, that God is ready to hear the prayers of his people and give them success when they offer up their prayers in the manner that he has appointed. Subsequently, in an humble attempt, he acknowledged the role of prayer, quote, in God's preserving and delivering the nation from the Jacobite rebellion in England and by defeating the French at Cape Breton in 1745, then two years later in the miraculous defeat of the French Armada. Let me now turn to Edwards and theologically correct petitionary prayer. So to what extent did Edwards's people grasp their minister's teaching on prayer? How much of Edwards's theological correctness sank into the hearts and minds of his people? To address these questions, we need to examine more closely other questions related to Edwards' own understanding of prayer. First, what is prayer? Second, why should Christians pray? Third, in what sense did the prayers of the saints make a difference? True prayer, Edwards observed in words nearly identical to that of Calvin, is nothing but faith expressed, or the voice of faith. It is a communicative act, the voice of faith to God through Christ. Quote, our faith in God is expressed in praying to God. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is expressed in praying to Christ and praying in the name of Christ. And the promises are made to asking in Christ's name in the same manner as they are to believing in Christ. Its source is holy affections. It is God's sovereignly ordained means of blessing. Here's Edwards, the spirit of God, the chief subject of prayer is the great purchase and promise of Christ. It is through the spirit's regenerating work that we are able to pray. This tr uh, Trinitarian dimension of prayer is summarized by Peter Beck. As God the Father stands at the headwaters of Edwards' theology of prayer, and the Son of God bridges the gap between creature and creator, the spirit of God bathes the entire process in the grace of God. Second, why should Christians pray? What is its purpose? We have already noted that according to Edwards, prayer is the one great and principal means of carrying on the designs of Christ's kingdom in the world. To that end, Edwards repeatedly emphasized that prayer is a duty enjoined upon all saints and sinners alike. It is, after all, a precept from Jesus himself. Christians pray for the blessing of the Spirit so that the Spirit of God may not leave us. One communes with God in prayer fulfilling the purpose for which he or she was created to enjoy and glorify God. Edwards was clear and adamant about what was not the purpose of prayer. In fact, the content of many of his sermons on prayer focus on correcting theologically flawed prayers. Consider the title of these sermons. There is no goodness in praying, though it be never so earnestly, merely out of fear of misery. Or another, God's manner is first to prepare men's hearts and then to answer their prayers. Another, tis in vain for any to expect to have their prayers heard as long as they continue in the allowance of sin. And finally, hypocrites deficient in the duty of prayer. In these and other sermons, Edwards challenged the commonly held notion that we pray to God, uh, that we pray to tell God about our circumstances, our needs, and our desires, or that God is in some way obliged to hear the prayers of obedient people. No, said Edwards, God knows your needs. Moreover, just because Christians are careful and conscientious in doing their duty by praying, God is under no obligation to hear their prayers, that is, to answer their prayers as they wished. In fact, no religious acts, seeking God, praying to him, or living a moral life obliges God in any way to convert sinners. No doubt, Edwards would have blanched at the lyrics of the 19th century hymn, Tell It to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus. All bad theology for Edwards. 
Why do we need to tell it to Jesus? He already knows. Prayer, Edwards asserted, has a different purpose. It is required as a means to prepare us for the mercies we need. Quote, we don't cause God's ear to hear, but he causes it. The mercy of God towards his people is not moved or drawn by them, but tis self-moved. Although the Bible speaks anthropomorphically of God being moved or persuaded by the prayers of his people, quote from Edwards, yet it is not to be thought that God is properly moved or made willing by our prayers, close quote. Instead, God bestows mercies as though, as though he were prevailed upon by prayer. It is, not the, it, is not, it is not the prayers of God's people that is the cause of God's mercy toward them, but, quote, from his own sovereign pleasure, he always shows mercy according to the pleasure of his will. The whole affair is uh, in beginning and end is from free grace. If, if, then, prayer is the voice of faith, if prayer is communing with God, if true prayer begins with God's initiating grace, then in what sense do the prayers of saints make a difference? And if they do make a difference, how do we know? Edwards repeatedly assured his people that they should pray because God is a God hearing, a prayer hearing God. Quote, God won't begrudge his people anything they ask as being too good for them. God stands ready to fulfill all their petitions and in anything that they ask that is for their own good. God is ready to bestow the blessings on his people that they need or desire. He delights in bestowing and waits for us to ask, and yet the asking is, quote, not to move him to bestow the blessing, but that we may be prepared to receive it. God is so ready at all times to hear and grant you whatever you desire that tends to your happiness. Of course, the question is, what does ultimately tend towards one's happiness? Here we confront a conundrum. On the one hand, Edwards insisted that God heard and responded to petitionary prayer. On the other, his high view of God's sovereignty, his conviction that God not only sustains the universe from moment to moment, but also acts according to rational and fixed laws in the realm of nature, led Norman Fearing to conclude that for Edwards, God does not capriciously intervene in particular cases. More to the point, argues Fearing, Edwards explicitly denied the efficacy of petitionary prayer to bring about external change in the world. The value of prayer lies primarily in its effect upon the souls of the prayerful. As Edwards stated in his treatise concerning religious affections, a work in which he wrote far more about insincere prayer than genuine prayer, the purpose of prayer is, quote, to affect our own hearts with the things we express and so to prepare us to receive the blessings we ask. Prayer has no effect on God, who is self-moved, but rather affects the person who prays. Since God cannot change in either his purposes or his knowledge, his answer to prayer is not a response to people's prayer as much as their prayers are a response to his predetermined answer. God has ordained that certain things will come to pass only as a result of offered prayers, which are themselves ordained by God to be offered. Perhaps the most that humans can affirm, concludes Glenn Crider in his analysis of Edwards' sermon, God is a prayer hearing God, is that God hears and responds to prayer and he also remains the sovereign of the universe. I'll come back to these matters shortly by examining a counterexample in Edwards' view of petitionary prayer, one that appears to affirm causation, but let me conclude this section by returning to the relationship between Edwards and his parishioners. Edwards' sermons were not composed in a vacuum. As a, quote, watchman on the walls of Zion, he observed the attitudes of his congregation, ever alert to the threat uh, of Arminianism and the, and the threat of hypocrisy. His sermons on prayer, many of which focused on theologically incorrect forms, addressed these threats. Why did he direct so much energy preaching against false understandings of prayer if they weren't a real problem in his congregation? According to cognitive scientists, the more complex that theological ideas are, the more they deviate from the ordinary con uh, cognition that undergirds natural religion, the more effort 
will be required to teach them and maintain them. Edwards expended great effort because his theology deviated from ordinary natural ways of thinking about petitionary prayer that humans as free moral agents can in some way influence God. To what extent did his sermons on petitionary prayer have their desired effect? How did persons in the pew respond to their pastor who assured them that God hears their prayers yet at the same time told them that God's response to their petitionary prayers was only apparent? Did they believe that this personal God could be moved by their prayers? Did they believe that every individual event always occurs as God willed or foreordained? Or did they see themselves as moral agents who could affect the outcome event of events? We cannot answer these questions with certainty, but we can be certain that Edwards was convinced that his parishioners needed theological correction. In his 2004 book, Theological Incorrectness, Why Religious People Believe What They Shouldn't, the cognitive scientist Jason Sloan argued you won't like this, argued that theology doesn't determine people's actual thoughts and behaviors. Sorry, clergy, he writes, rather snarkily, but theological ideas simply do not determine, per se, how or what people think. Rather, religious ideas and behavior are constrained by the ordinary cognitive mechanisms involved in everyday non-religious behavior. He points to the work of Justin Barrett, who, while a professor at Calvin College, conducted several experiments with students who presumably believe that God controls every event in the world, including their eternal destiny. Yet his task-specific experiments revealed that when faced with what Barrett called online thinking, quick and immediate, the students didn't believe this dogma. When asked questions that allowed them to reflect on their beliefs, however, they answered in a theologically correct way. According to Sloan, absolute sovereignty is a maximally counterintuitive concept and thus inherently unstable because of its cognitive burden. Simply put, if God controls everything, then humans control nothing, and that is hard to believe. The doctrine goes against the grain of natural cognition, namely that we are actors who can freely and willfully choose to act. Sloan speculates that because of this hard to believe doctrine, Calvinism has had a short shelf life. Uh, historically, he's off the mark, but he does point to a trend that gained momentum in the Great Awakening, the emphasis on the role of self-agency. He concludes, Calvinism proves to be less likely to survive over the long run because it is a burdensome idea that precludes the role of human agency. So much for Colin Hansen's Young, Restless, Reformed, a now decade-old book about Calvinist renaissance in America. Within the context of petitionary prayer, we can see why Edwards' views were a challenge to his congregation, as Sloan puts it, hard to believe. On the one hand, their prayer bids exhibited theological correctness. On the other, the natural human proclivity to resort to natural inferences about psychological agency led them to believe that their prayers in some way could influence God's actions toward them and toward the world. Edwards was passionate that prayer was God's appointed means of salvation, Yet the lost were told that their prayers were not acceptable to God. All that a natural man does in seeking salvation is wrong. Why then pray? Again, because God commands it. The most that one can say is that, quote, the prayers of sinners, though they have no goodness in them, yet are made a means of preparation for mercy. Now finally, and I'll try to quickly move through this, uh, Edwards, the National Covenant and Subtle Forms of Divine Causation. In other contexts, Edwards and fellow Calvinists appeared to recognize a greater role for human agency. Two modes of thought. God controls and directs everything, and yet humans can in some way influence God, existed side by side. And perhaps it exists in the minds of all Christians who affirm God's sovereignty and human agency. The Puritan notion of national covenant best exemplifies the view that, quote, that prayer can influence God's actions an extension of the covenant of works which demanded that people regulate their own lives and others by the keeping of God's laws, the national covenant envisioned the Puritans as Israel of old. Individuals, communities, and nations were blessed or punished according to their obedience to God. Days of communal fasting and prayer and covenant renewal addressed the need to reset the relationship to God or to petition God for his blessings, even his intervention. 
Perhaps the most explicit example of national covenant theology in Edwards' writings is found in his sermons and correspondence dealing with King George's War, a war that extended the larger European conflict between England and France to America. Edwards was a loyal British subject and patriot who viewed military warfare as necessary to ensure not only the safety and independence of English colonists, but also as a form of spiritual warfare against the depredations of the Catholic Church, AKA the Antichrist. On April 4th, 1745, Edwards preached a fast day sermon for success in the expedition against Cape Breton, a key military outpost in the French fortified town of Louisbourg. The odds were not in favor of the English. They had assembled 4,300 inexperienced troops, including 20 from Edwards's congregation, and set out from Boston on March 24th for a 600-mile journey. They faced a French regiment of 4,000 regulars in addition to French naval forces. The Gibraltar of the New World, as it was called, a fort set on high cliffs, appeared impregnable. Edwards called upon his people to pray. He assured them that God alone, quote, determines the event of war and gives the victory. But he also impressed upon his hearers uh, of their duty. Should the people offer up their prayers in a manner that he has appointed, God is ready to hear their prayers and give them success. What's striking is the last comment, give them success. Edwards could never be so sure about the efficacy of prayers in matters of salvation but here he boldly states that God will bring about that which was requested by the parishioners, success in battle, if the people humbly and fervently seek God's help. As James Byrd notes, prayer was pragmatic. Nothing could determine the outcome of a battle more decisively than prayer because prayer enabled uh, people to unleash God's aid on the battlefield. And then Edwards gives a whole lot of examples uh, from the Old Testament of uh, victory in battle. Others shared neither Edwards' interpretive framework nor his optimism. In a letter to his brother, Benjamin Franklin pointed out the inexperience of the colonial forces and the daunting task of capturing the fort of Cape Breton. He then turned to calculating the potential effectiveness of prayer. Quote, you have a fast and prayer day in which I compute 500,000 petitions were offered up uh, to the same effect in New England. Then he goes on, if each New England family had prayed twice a day since the day the general court approved the military plan, another 45 million prayers could be offered up to God. On the Catholic side, quote, a few priests in the garrison prayed to the Virgin Mary. If one measures potential success by the quantity of prayers, then the New Englanders should win the battle hands down. Yet, continued Franklin, if you do not succeed, I fear I shall have but an indifferent opinion of Presbyterian prayers in such cases as long as I live. Indeed, in attacking strong towns, I should have more dependence on works than on faith. Remarkably, remarkably through God's special providence, even miraculous intervention, declared Edwards, the English defeated the French at Cape Breton. In a lengthy letter to a sport correspondent in Scotland, Edwards announced that the victory was, quote, the most remarkable of its kind that has been in many ages, and a great evidence of God's being one that hears prayer, and a great argument that we live in an age wherein divine wonders are to be expected." Close quote. He offered details of the expedition, noting God's specific providential ordering of circumstances, the favorable vote of the assembly, carried by a majority of one single vote, the moderate and fair weather, the kept secrecy of the mission, the preservation of the soldiers from smallpox, the support of the English man of war, the advantages, uh, advantageous timing of the, of the attack, the French desertion of the fort, the discovery of abandoned cannon, et cetera, et cetera. Thus declared Edwards, God gave into our hands the place of greatest importance of any that the French have in North America, the principal fountain of the king of France's wealth from these parts of the world and the key to all his northern colonies and the chief annoyance of the British colonies. What George Marsden has called Edwards' providentialist patriotism continued on full display as Edwards subsequently interpreted the quashing of the rebellion of the young pretender, British victories in Europe, especially the failed effort of the French fleet to retake Louisbourg as, quote, the wonderful and immediate hand of heaven against these enemies of God's people, 
Indeed, consider how ready God has shown himself to appear on our side. Yet two years later, Edwards' guaranteed success of the prayers of the people met the realities of international diplomacy. On October 18th, 1748, in the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle, the French handed Louisbourg back to the French. What became of the provincials' prayers? Had they not been answered? Or was a setback only temporary, a postponement of an inevitable battle between the forces of, of a covenant people and the Antichrist, a prelude to God's great work of cosmic redemption? Edwards' pleas for petitionary prayer against the French and his later account of English victory lends itself to analysis from the perspective of cognitive science. In a recent article on petitionary prayer, Martin Boudry and Johann de Smet discuss, quote, the implicit belief patterns about the causal mechanism by which God affects changes in the world. They review various experiments and studies of petitionary prayer, concluding that religious believers prefer, prefer modes of divine action that are subtle and indistinguishable from the natural course of events. Why? To quote them, because believers will have a better chance of finding themselves in a situation in which they can attribute the events in question to God answering their prayers compared to those who expect full-blown miracles. The fact is people won't keep praying for undeniable supernatural acts if the results are invariably disappointing. Instead, they will engage in a process of self-correction, again what Barrett calls conceptual, uh, conceptual control, and favor subtle divine intervention, especially in situations of high ambiguity and high threat, such as the Cape Breton military expedition. The authors know three things in which divine causality is rendered subtle and unascertainable. First, God may intervene in situations where causal relations are practically impossible to assess. For example, weather phenomena, natural disasters, success in sports, victory on the battlefield, changes in government. Second, God may intervene in natural processes that are invisible or difficult to observe directly. For example, being protected from or cured from or stricken from a disease. And third, God may act as a partial agent in combination with natural causes in a way that makes it difficult to separate the respective contributions, for example, uh, giving strength to win a game, emboldening soldiers to fight, successfully completing an exam, supporting a bridge on the verge of collapse, etc. As is apparent from his account of the Lewisburg battle, Edwards calls to mind all three forms of subtle divine intervention, something he also did in a humble attempt and in his earlier Redemption Discourses, a sermon series delivered in 1739, published posthumously as a history of the work of redemption. Baudry and de Smet remark, given that the causal structure of the world is partly inscrutable, beliefs in subtle and unascertainable modes of supernatural causation will be compelling and cognitively appealing because they are more susceptible to occasional confirmation and less vulnerable to repeated disconfirmation. Under the interpretive gaze of Edwards, or I would say through his eyes of faith, the many circumstances contributing to the English victory at Louisburg confirmed supernatural causation that, after the fact, was neither inscrutable, subtle, nor unascertainable. This was a case where the prayers of the saints was susceptible to confirmation. A prayer hearing God responded according to their desires. Although many Protestants in, colon in colonial America, including theological liberals such as Charles Chauncey, shared Edwards' views of providentialist patriotism, devout Catholics and skeptics such as Franklin would have been hard pressed to interpret the specific events of the English victory from this perspective. Later critics of Edwards' history of the work of redemption shared a similar perspective, deriding Edwards' interpretation of history as, quote, a work of the most unbridled imagination and of an intoxicated visionary presumingly, uh, presuming to see the will of God. Yet for Edwards, not only does all of human history participate in the drama of Christian redemption, he was also convinced that he could identify precisely those events that gave proof of this drama. Conclusion, I have tried to show how cognitive science can offer insights into religious belief and practice, and in particular to that of petitionary prayer. 
I noted how two strands of reasoning, the natural or intuitive and the reflective or deliberative, exist side by side, often in tension, sometimes in contradiction. There exists a chasm between basic religious concepts and the scaffolding of theological concepts. Within Calvinism, and particularly in Edwards, this tension was exacerbated by an emphasis on God's absolute sovereignty. Here, the focus of petitionary prayer shifted from its effect on God to its effect on the petitioner. Yet, this theological move could not be maintained consistently, either by Edwards' congregation or, as I have suggested, even by Edwards himself. When faced with the very real threat of extermination by the French, Edwards did not pray for renewed spiritual attitude, but for God to answer his prayers by intervening directly and giving success. However one might interpret this request within the larger purposes of God, that is, that God alone determines the event of war and gives victory, Edward linked cause, asking God to bring about a certain state of affairs, with effect, victory at Cape Breton. Did this petition contradict Edwards' contention that, quote, the mercy of God towards his people is not moved or drawn by them, but tis self-moved? Is this a case where, according to cognitive science, scientists, an inference generated during religious thought comes from the activation of ordinary cognitive resources? We may view these findings not simply as an exercise of historical retrieval, but from the perspective of challenges facing every Christian. Aside from one specific theological outlook, whether Arminian or Calvinist or something in between, cognitive science directs our attention to the proclivity to theological incorrectness. While belief in God may be a natural product of our common cognitive faculties, we are continually faced with a challenge of maintaining theological correctness. In cognitive science terms, this is realized only by a process of cultural scaffolding, that is, by deliberate attention to preaching, teaching, prayer, and worship. Pastors and theologians would do well to appreciate the contributions of cognitive science, particularly its insights into how human nature comes to accept or reject and act upon or ignore those theological views that define and inform their respective traditions. In doing so, they may better lead their fellow Christians to a more mature understanding of the faith, one that attends to the words of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for a good paper you've given this room full of theologians, a lot to engage. Uh, we're recording both the lecture and the discussion. So if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please come on up to one of the microphones and we'll get to you in just a moment. Uh, while you're thinking about what you might want to ask, I've got a couple of theological starter questions uh, for you, Dr. Kling, and I, I guess you could answer them like historians often do, sort of answer them for Edwards, <clears throat> or you could answer them as David Kling, the Presbyterian elder, you know, whichever way you want to do it okay. uh, is fine. Uh, the, the first question is, so if the cognitive scientists are right about this and our natural ways of thinking about God and prayer are so theologically incorrect, is it best theologically for us uh, to refer to them as natural, full stop, or do theologians need to qualify uh, what we're saying uh, along these lines by saying these are a function of sin, um, these are not natural in the sense that God built them into us, um, these are instinctive. How should we think about that? Why, why are most people's natural ways of thinking about these things so wrong? Um, that's a good question. It's a question that I think we addressed a little bit last night and gave no answer to, as a matter of fact. Um, well, you've had 12 hours to think about it. Yeah, well, um, I had to sleep too, so. Um, these natural inclinations or intuitions or tacit belief, whatever you want to call them, it seems to me, um, if, you want to, if they are part of human nature, and I'm just probably repeating your question, does that reflect um, the result of original sin in some way? 
Is that the question you're asking? Yeah. And I don't have the answer to that question. Um, some of you who may be more um, uh, attuned to these matters of original sin might have the answer to that. But, and in fact, I'm not, since Edwards was not aware of cognitive science, uh, even though I think some of the things that he wrote, um, wrote about addressed what I think is related to cognitive science, um, I think he would probably attribute these things to uh, the fall. So it seems to me that that would make better sense than simply some innate intuitive um, uh, basic belief that we have. Yeah. yeah. The other starter question I was thinking about is more practical, still pretty theological, but it's practical. Um, is it really best theologically, either in Edward's view, in your view, to say that prayer doesn't change anything other than ourselves, right? I mean, it does seem to me in most of our theological traditions, right. Reformed tradition, Arminian, Anabaptist, Lutheran, right. Roman right. Catholics, Orthodox, you know, there's ways of maintaining a traditional doctrine of God, God's sovereignty, God's immutability, and then simultaneously teaching that prayer does change things not just subjectively, but sort of out yeah. in the world as well. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think we should process this as divinity school people? Well, it seems to me that all of us who are committed Christians can, can probably cite incidences in our lives where we, can, we, we, we say we're convinced that God has answered our prayers. I want to say that in some sense, affirm God's sovereignty, but the question is how does one understand God's sovereignty? Is God's sovereignty understood um, from the long-term perspective of God working out his, his plan of redemption uh, toward the end of things. And, and within that scope, humans are allowed um, a certain amount of free agency and that within that, God indeed will respond to the prayers of his people. And um, so I, there's a certain indeterminacy, I want to say there's a certain indeterminacy that depends on humans themselves. Uh, offering up their prayers to God. I mean, I want it, again, if you think about it, um, you know, then why pray if all we're doing is sort of setting ourselves spiritually? Uh, most of us who pray want something to happen when we pray, right? Uh, and it's not simply, it's not simply to make us better spiritual persons, but we want something to happen when we pray uh, in petitionary prayer. So yeah, I think a lot of this, and the one, you know, you've got issues of divine sovereignty over against um, human agency and humans believing that what they do can affect change. Yeah. I don't see any questions in the audience, so I'll keep asking you questions. <laughs> okay. I'm interested in this. Um, well, I, you know, let me just ask. I, I can ask, if, if you don't mind, I can ask the audience. Have you encountered in your congregations this sort of disconnect uh, between what we might think of as um, uh, pretty immature theological perspectives that need constant that need constant correcting within the congregation, or do you experience the same kind of thing that Luther did, you know, in in regard to uh, uh, active righteousness versus passive righteousness, and convincing people that indeed the gospel um, contains uh, within it uh, the recognition that there is nothing you can do. Despite the fact that I think it always creeps in, we know this intellectually, but I think we play mind games in terms of this kind of, um, if I do these things, God will somehow bless me. And um, that's, that's an issue that I think affects, afflicts all Christians who think about these matters. Yeah. Well, how about it, audience members? Any, uh, any wisdom from experience about coaching people with respect to prayer? Yeah, we need you at the mic. How about if I don't answer that and I ask you a question? <laughs> Just as you were speaking, um, and maybe you basically answered this already, but one of the things, so you said that we expect God to do something. I think that's right. Um, 
And Calvin talks about us being what happens, basically, that something happens to us. If you push that just a little further, I think one of the things you find in people in the church is that when prayers are, I'll say, unanswered, if I can put it in those right, terms, right. Um, something does happen um, in that many people will say, what happened is that I felt God's presence mm -hmm. through this mm -hmm. disaster. Mm -hmm. So it's more of an affective right. response. Right. And it's not even a spiritual, you know, that I grew, maybe, sometimes not. But so when cognitive scientists suggest, I'll just say that empirically, uh, this is counterintuitive, that, be, that we would pray knowing that the odds of God actually giving us what we ask are pretty slim, yeah. uh, that that yeah. pushes. I wonder if they've studied or if it would be worth thinking about what actually happens affectively right. to people right. when they pray. And if that is more intuitive than what might be at first glance thought about, right? Yeah. Um, it seems to me there's, if one is praying for a specific outcome and that outcome does not occur, as you're suggesting, um, there is a kind of reset, an internal spiritual reset. Uh, as you suggest, an effective kind of a reset, understanding that God may not answer the prayer as I wish this prayer to be answered. But again, as Christians have argued throughout the centuries, God has God's own purposes for all of this. So I think th the reason that we Christians can engage in petitionary prayer with the recognition that our prayers are not always answered as we want them to pray is that there's a more fundamental theological conviction that drives us. Yeah, and so just to say, just to push a little bit further, um, I think what I was getting at is not so much that at the end of the day when God doesn't answer my prayer for this cure or this friend not to die or whatever, it's maybe there's an internal recognition at some point that God had his own purposes and that I will never have any clue what those are. Right. But it's more this idea of God's presence in the crisis that, and that's why I say F affective rather than this sort of intellectual reasoning about why God did what he did. I think a lot of us go through that, but I've also seen many people seem not to need to do that, at least not to the extent that I often feel right, the need right. to do that. But just recognize that through this all, in hindsight, I see that indeed God was with me. What does that mean? Comfort, again, affective responses right. versus intellectual responses. Yeah, and yeah. I think that would be an interesting thing yeah, for those cognitive been, uh, folks there to There have been study. plenty of studies done uh, uh, with those having uh, health problems and uh, the recognition that, um, uh, for example, uh, people have AIDS and they, and they recognize that uh, they are not going to be healed. Uh, but through, through prayer, uh, there comes that effective response that, uh, and in fact, studies have indicated that those who, who approach things in that way can actually deal uh, better with the disease, uh, the continuation of the disease, and those that do not have that approach towards things. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think you're probably on to something with, with Edward's uh, severe form of Calvinism and some of the contradictions that may raise. I wonder though if there's something uh, to describing him as a pietistic pastor here and or uh, a neoplatonic philosopher, um, which might help to soften some of those edges. Uh, on one hand, yes, about the kind of the pastoral or congregational situation, yeah. and, and I see people at my own church who are very concerned about the external circumstances, but they forget about like how God may be wanting to work in the soul. And so uh, my own pastor, who is a pietist very much, um, will remind people, think about what God is doing inside of you, look for the changes there first before the world. And that's a pietistic move, right? Interiority comes before the external. Um, and then uh, likewise, I wonder if, if Edwards is not just a pietist here, but also a Neoplatonist, and that he's saying, yes, these uh, prayers will be answered in time with kind of the furthest reach from the center. That, that is, we pray towards the center, which is God's inscrutable being and will, but that begins to emanate out into the life of the soul and eventually into, into all of history. 
and sometimes Edward's just trying to read history, you know, off the face of history, but m maybe prayer is kind of emanating in such a way that he'll even dare to comment on, on battles and such. Um, but that has more to do with him being more of a Neoplatonist or a Pietist than it does with him being yeah. a Calvinist. I, I don't know if, that, if that's fair. I guess what's, what, what has struck me, you know, you would think you would get um, the content of his sermons on prayer, I often thought were more appropriate for theologians, not for his congregation, in a sense. Because I wondered how the congregation would receive the kinds of things he said about prayer, or to what extent they, they understood all that he was saying about prayer. I mean, were they, again, with his congregation, you have these theologically correct prayers that are embedded in the uh, prayer bids. They all sound straight, um, Orthodox Calvinism. But on the other hand, you kind of figure out something else is going on. If he has to spend so much time trying to correct people's, from his perspective, trying to correct the way in which they thought about prayer, asking God for all these things, for temporal uh, relief, and we might say, well, gee, that was, they should be asking for those kinds of things, right? But from Edward's perspective, to some extent, that was almost illegitimate despite the fact that he himself asked for prayers for himself, for his family, his children. There, there, there seems to me that there is this tension that I don't know how to resolve. Um, and again, I would simply go back to the, the idea that, yes, God is sovereign, but within the, that um, sovereign plan, uh, humans can, in, I don't think Edwards would say this, but humans can, in some sense, affect God's response in time. Um, so, yeah. Okay, last question. No. Greg, you get the last word. Come on. Uh, how much do you think, you know, you think about teaching and preaching. Um, uh, how much of it is, it, it, it's, it's didactic. That is to say, you know what, you're, you're teaching what is true. It's a, it ought to be the way we live. We don't always do that. So is there, uh, and so we, we, you know, we read Edward's sermons, we see the titles of the sermons, etc., and he's doing the right thing. People are, are, are sort of, in a sense, is it, is it, is it, has it been disinfected? Has it been sanitized? So that then you, you see this tension between the two. Uh, I mean, how many of us who teach and preach what is true, how, how accurately or consistently do we live that? Right. So I, just, I wonder if, if, you know, if there's some of that that's going on as well. So you hear this strong message, which is right, but then there's the, the experiential, the existential, that there just creates a tension of sort of a now and a not yet. And, and, and sort of thing. And so I wonder if there's some of that as well. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, and again, uh, if you know Edwards, um, on the one hand, you want to say he knew his congregation. On the other hand, you want to say he really didn't, didn't know his congregation because he was spending so much time in his study writing out sermons and writing out theological treatises. So it's, it, it, it's difficult to know the exact extent to which he understood what his parishioners were going through. It's not that he didn't care, but there were uh, other issues, I think, that he gave priority to. I, and I've often wondered, Doug, you would know the answer to this, if, um, if, any, of the, if any of these matters factored into his uh, dismissal from Northampton. Were there any theological issues, or was it all kind of personal? Um, yeah, I mean, I know it was uh, related to communion practices and all the rest, but uh, did it did anybody ever say, look, I don't understand what you're saying. You're not getting through to me. <laughs> uh, 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 we'd be better off without you. Yeah. Well, people thought he was an unusual guy and was unusually idealistic yeah. you know, with respect to what it means to live the Christian life well. And that did create some tension yeah. in his conversation. Well, we are out of time. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Would you join me in thanking Dr. Kling? Thank you.